Good evening. We're glad to see all of you here for tonight's program. This program is presented in partnership with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries on the library Zoom webinar platform. Thank you to library staff members, Sarah Jones, Jessica Goodman, and Victor Willis for your assistance. As many of you know, society volunteers are again staffing the desk in the genealogy room at the downtown library. We hope you will help us fill the staffing schedule by becoming a volunteer staffer. We also invite you to come to the library to use our comprehensive genealogical reference collection during library open hours. October is Family History Month. What better way to celebrate than to get back into our genealogical research? Just a reminder, patrons must wear face masks at the library, regardless of vaccination status. The Society's DNA Special Interest Group held another session earlier today. The DNA SIG will hold its next meeting on Tuesday, November 2. Look for reminder notices about the time and place of the next DNA session. The Society's Irish Special Interest Group will meet Thursday evening, October 28, from 7 to 8 p.m. via Zoom. Sean Conley will lead a discussion of Irish place names and Irish names. Look for a notice soon explaining how to register for the Irish SIG. In a moment, I'll introduce tonight's speaker. First though, I want to let you know about upcoming programs and society activities. In November, I'm pleased to announce that Terry Jackson, a member of the Monterey County Genealogical Society, will show us the ins and outs of using familysearch.org. Terry will let us know about some of the new tools there and will explain how we can get the most out of our research at Family Search. The November program will be on Zoom. As many of you know, we had hoped to resume in-person programmings at the library by November. Our board of directors, however, recently determined to continue to offer our programs via Zoom through the remainder of this year. Jessica Goodman, Sarah Jones, and Victor Willis with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries have graciously and generously committed to continuing to support our programs as they have been doing so ably throughout 2021. I'm excited to announce that we will, we will resume in-person programs beginning in January, 2022. I plan to continue our tradition of starting the new year with a genealogically oriented writing program. So pack your mask, your pencil and your notebook and mark your calendar for Tuesday, January 4. And I'm delighted to announce that on Tuesday, February 1, we will hear a live in-person presentation by Stephen Morse on how we can best prepare to use the 1950 federal census upon release of that census next spring. Many of you are familiar with Stephen Morse and his wonderful one-step genealogical tools, so you won't want to miss this program. Meanwhile, we have scheduled the Genealogy Society holiday luncheon for Thursday, December 2 at the Crow's Nest. I'm sure you join me in anticipating the resumption of this joyful event. Reservation details for the holiday luncheon will be forthcoming soon. The luncheon will be in place of a regular program for that month. We anticipate, however, that the DNA Special Interest Group will meet uh, earlier in the week on Tuesday, December 7th. As many of you know, 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County. Due to COVID issues, we postponed our celebration of this milestone until 2022, but now the party is on. We will celebrate a half century of researching our families, our communities, and our roots at the Museum of Art and History on Saturday, March 5, 2022, from 1 to 5 p.m. We're looking for lots of help to make this event memorable. Contact Leslie Losey to learn how you can help, and you can email Leslie at staff, that's S-T-A-F-F, -F, at S-C-G-E-N-S-O-C, that's S-C-G-E-N-S-O-C dot org, attention Leslie. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by Kathy Nielsen, who will present her program, A New Life for Old Photos, Identifying, Organizing, and Restoring Photos. Photos capture our stories and those of family and friends who lived before us. They give insights into the world of our ancestors, but our photo collections can be overwhelming. Many of us have hundreds, if not thousands of photos, and most are decades old. So where do we start? 
Tonight, Kathy will share tips on identifying, organizing, and restoring old photos. <clears throat> she will introduce us to Restore, a new and easy photo editing application. She will encourage us not to give up on our family's precious memories. There is hope. Kathy Nielsen is a reference librarian and an educator. She is currently a popular genealogy speaker on the Monterey Peninsula and has been featured on Lisa Louise Cook's weekly YouTube program, Elevenses. She is a co-founder of the Monterey County Genealogy Society Special Interest Writing Group, Off the Charts. Kathy incorporates her skills as a historian, storyteller, and librarian in her search for her family's history. Please join me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Kathy Nielsen. Thank you, Gail. Well, nice to, I wish I could see you all, um, but it's nice to be here tonight. Today, I'm going to share with you um, my journey of dealing with photos. And first, I'm going to start sharing the screen. So the old saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Photos do indeed tell a story. Photographs tell us about the people, the place, who took it, how it was taken, how it got here in our hands, why it was taken, and why did the photographer take it the way he did? So it tells us a story about a time and a place and a people. It also tells us about what's happening in time and history. And each photo can be placed in historical context. After all, it was a photographer who set up the picture and framed it, and he lived during that time. So this is a picture of my family, my Swedish family in Ripon, which is a small town near Modesto. And my father did uh, scan this picture and left a kind of cryptic caption on the back. He said, May, Mom, Hazel, Helen, and Jenny. Now, I did know that the house in the back is the Ripon family house. So I did know that this picture was taken in Ripon. And I could see my grandmother there in the white cap and my grandfather in the bowler hat next to her in the back row. And on the left are the three, my three aunts, were Hazel, Helen, and Arlene. So I could identify those people, but I had to look a little bit more closely to see a great aunt Jenny on the right with her baby and her husband Johnny, who is next to his proudly next to his automobile, which is probably about a 1918 Dodge. So as I started to put the family groups together, I could see who these people were. And knowing the, the year of the car, I could identify it as probably 1918. My father's not in the picture. And my father was born in 1919. So I know that it was before that date. This is probably a picture that was taken as a family was saying goodbye. The Jenny and Johnny were a brother and sister to my grandmother and grandfather. They were, so I have lots of double cousins. So they lived in Fresno and they probably came up to visit and see their sister and brother and their new house and to see the kids. And it was a, um, a little bit of an adventure in the, new, in the new 1918 car. So there's a story with this picture. Stories are one of the things we need most in life. They feed our souls. And this is another picture that feeds my soul. This is a picture of my dad. It's not a great picture, but it is a picture that definitely tells a story. Um, my family was part of the 1950s and 60s migration to the suburbs. And this is the kitchen in the ranch house where I was raised as, uh, as a youngster. Um, notice the 1950s wallpaper, the uh, dishwasher, which my mother must have loved the coffee pot, the AM radio, um, the rotary dial phone, the bills and letters on the wall. Of course, we don't get as many letters as we did in the 1950s. So this is a picture that brings back lots of memories, memories of my brother and I having breakfast at the counter on the, getting ready for school. Um, these are the kinds of pictures you want to save, even though they're not great pictures, because they bring back memories and you can tell the story. Some of you may have had this address book. This You can see that that's next to the rotary dial phone. This was um, a metal address telephone uh, 
book where you move that plastic thing down on the right side to the letter, popped it open, and there was a telephone, and you could make telephone number, and you could make your, um, your call. So um, this just brings back lots of memories. The Mitchell Library, which is in Sydney, it's the like our California State Library, which is in, in uh, Sydney, has in its foyer, all great stories lead back to us. So stories, we are the tellers of stories and we are the receivers of stories. Stories are one of the most things we need in this life and they feed our souls. We are the teller and the receivers of these tales. What better way to do that than through photos? I want to give credit to Maureen Taylor because I've learned so much from her and many of you may have um, heard her at different conferences. She has a podcast and she's written books and she blogs and she speaks all over the country. And I follow her because uh, she's always got interesting things to say about photos. She's written a couple of books. This book I really do recommend if you haven't seen it. It's called The Family Photo Detective. And she talks about the clues that help you identify those photos that you have no idea who's in the, in the picture. She's also written two other books, Bonnets and Hats and Hairstyles. And she talks about how bonnets and hats will help you date a picture and hairstyles will help you date a picture. So she's someone to follow if this is a subject that interests you. On your handout, I've listed some other authors that you might want to check out if you are interested in, in further identifying some of your mystery photos. So let's talk about identifying photos. Let's look first at the format of the photo. And that would be look going back to 1839 and the daguerreotype. And then we'll get into the photographer, how that can give us clues. The captions, of course, can give us clues. They may be cryptic at times, but they can help us. The background or location in the picture helps. The clothing, maybe you can identify the house as I could with that ribbon picture. Maybe you knew the garden and a car certainly can help us date the picture. Facial features uh, and facial recognition is a tool we can use. And then your own genealogical research, your dates, your family groups, um, where, where uh, they were living at that time can help. And finally, local and national history can help us place that picture in time. So let's look first at the format. If you are lucky enough to have a daguerreotype, hold on to it, treat it gently, and, and preserve it in an archival box of some kind. The daguerreotype was the first photo that was taken in 1839. And they were popular till about 1860. They were usually in a case. They were a copper plate with a shiny mirror-like surface coated with silver. They were framed by a map. They had to be held at an angle to be seen. Otherwise, the picture would disappear and it would become almost like a mirror. This is one of a famous poet and author in the 1850s. So this rare photo is priced at $7,000, but they were still pricey even for the regular person uh, during that time. They were about $250 to $6 to have it taken. And today that would be about $75 to $175. So daguerreotypes were really only taken by those who could afford it. But that was the first photo. Then came the ambrotype, and they were a little cheaper. They were about 25 cents to 45 cents. So that would be about $8. So they were more manageable. They were a negative image on glass, backed with a dark backing. And if you were to touch the surface, the image would disappear. So you definitely, if you have an ambrotype, you definitely do not want to take this out of a case. It tends to flake off on the back of the glass, which then means you lose the picture. It has a 3D appearance and it's usually in a case. Now the ambrotype and the daguerreotype um, require that you sit still for several minutes. In some cases, the daguerreotype, it might be up to 15 minutes. So this made this quite a project. Things got a little easier when the tintype came and that you may very likely have some in your family. This was uh, usually maybe three to two inches. 
it was a negative on iron or steel plate. It wasn't actually on tin. It was called a tin type because it was cut with tin shears, tin cutting shears, but it was not actually a tin type. It was magnetic though. So you could, if you have one, you put a magnet by it, you could confirm that it was a tin type. It's on a black metal background. It's a muddy quality. And if it were kept out in light, it would darken over time. And I, I have a couple in my family and they have gotten very muddy. They were often put in a paper mat or a case. Um, they were fairly inexpensive, five cents, maybe a dollar fifty today. And wagons would actually pull up in front of an amusement park or uh, a beach. And you could have the tin type taken and you would be able to take it home with you. So it's almost like those booths that we had in our in our childhood where you could take the pictures of four, uh, four shots of yourself and then go home with it. So this was quite popular, very popular during the Civil War to remember um, your a soldier in your family who went off to war and he'd take a tin type of his family with him. This is one of my grandfather and you can see it's in a white um, kind of matte case. And I and this is another tin type which survived a little bit better. This one was 1877 and this one's 1879. He's um, a couple of years old and then he's four years old in the second one. But you can see how muddy uh, that that one has gotten. And I've worked on a little bit, which I'll share with you later. The carte de visette came from France and it was an image on a thin card, two and three eighths inches. It was like a calling card and you would exchange it on birthday or holidays. And this was also popular during the Civil War. And it was on thinner, the, the more the older ones were on thinner paper. Um, you may have some that are on a, a, a harder cardboard. Those are a little later. And then the cabinet card came. So actually all of these decades help you date the picture. So if you happen to have any of these photos, you know that that picture was taken during this decade. The cabinet card was called a cabinet card because it was put in a little holder on cabinets and it would sit there in the parlor or in a, in a room. It was on cardboard backing. It was about 6.5 inches by 4.5 inches. And it usually would have the photographer's name and location, which was really helpful in terms of, of locating what family this picture belonged to. This particular one was taken in 1893. And then at the turn of the century and photos started to get overwhelming, the Brownie camera was introduced in 1900. Eastman Kodak would put out an annual handbook for the everyday photographer and people started taking pictures. The, the camera only cost a dollar, and uh, which would be about $30 today. So it was really something that people could uh, handle. So many of the photos that we have that are at the turn of the century are taken by a brownie camera. Eastman Kodak's claim said, you press the button, we do the rest. This is again, my family, my Swedish family. This is probably in, uh, Kingsburg, and um, this is my great grandfather, Anders Petter Anderson. Now, unfortunately, he looked the same for about three decades, so I can't use him to actually date uh, pictures. But his daughter next to him, his daughter in law, and my grandfather, um, I can tell that they're all in their 20s, and so I can tell that this picture probably is taken about 1900, probably one of the first brownie, brownie um, pictures. So every picture tells a story. It tells us who owned the photo. It tells us who took the photo. It tells us who's in the photo. What is the event? When it was taken, where it was taken, and maybe even why it was taken. Sort of the who, what, when, where, why journalistic questions. This particular photo is of my great grandfather. This is taken in the Dakotas the North Dakota Territory. He came to, um, he immigrated from Sweden in 1880 and he was a tenant farmer in Sweden and he came to America and acquired 160 acres uh, through the Homestead Act in 1862 and came to the Dakota Territory, which at that time was pretty undeveloped. This is a picture of him in, D in the Dakotas um, with his butter churn. I don't know if this is a shed or the steps of his house, 
Um, but I love the fact that he was wearing the Levi jeans, which of course were popular with the, the gold rush. Um, his Swedish hat, he had a wedding ring on, his scuffed shoes and his, his ripped cuffs on his jeans and the jackets hung on pegs outside the door. He was only in his 40s when this picture was taken. He was 40 when he came to America in 1880 and he was in the Dakotas for 10 years before he moved to Kingsburg, California. So he was in his 40s. So he's had a hard life already. So the clues, again, the format of the photo can tell you the decade. So you can get an idea of when that picture might have been taken. And if you're lucky to have one of those early photos, just treasure it and um, be sure and scan it and put it away in a safe um, archival uh, box. Um, the clues, the background location helps us, the building, the house, garden, the clothing, and an automobile. So let's take a look at some of these, these clues and how they help us identify a photo. So this picture is of my grandmother. And maybe you can recognize where this is. They had a ranch in Prunedale. And this is Highway 101. The rocks in the background are the famous rocks, which are north of Prunedale. Um, on the left-hand side, it, you know, you, this is the right-hand side, but as you go through that area where the eucalyptus trees are on Highway 101, um, the robbers would jump out and rob the stagecoaches. Their house was south of that. And this is taken from their property on the hill, looking down on the road. She was probably about 20 at this time. At this time. So this, and she was born in 1878. So this photo was very likely taken at the end of the century, uh, 1898, something like that. So by knowing that she, her, knowing her age, knowing where she lived and recognizing that background, um, I know that that's Highway 101, to be Highway 101. This is a picture from the Monterey Public Library collection in the California History Room of the Hotel Del Monte. And that is the Hotel Del Monte. It burned down three times, but this is one of the structures. This was taken of the kitchen staff and it was taken by CWJ Johnson, who actually had a parlor or a studio on the grounds of the Hotel Del Monte. So by recognizing the hotel, seeing the photographer, and knowing that C.W. Day Johnson had a parlor um, on the grounds of the hotel, um, we know that that was one of, of probably the kitchen staff. Another picture. This is a house that my great grandfather built in Kingsburg, a Victorian Queen Anne style with lots of gingerbread. Um, he had uh, his fruit trees. And this is a picture of him with his daughter-in-law and his wife. Now his wife was only 59 years old. You know, she came from Sweden as well. You can see she probably has rheumatism, maybe arthritis in her fingers. Um, they are, she's 59, he's in his 60s. Their daughter-in-law is in her probably 20s, 30s. And the reason why I can date this is because I know that they moved from this house in 1904, and I know that she died in 1904. And so this is the turn of the century. Um, and the hats, of course, help with that, uh, determining that date. Just wanted to remind you, some of you may use this tool. This is a great tool. If you don't know, if there's a background picture with some uh, something that might be a distinctive, put your scanned picture into Google Images. Just drop it in and search by image. I've had really great luck. My father was in uh, a veteran in, during World War II. He was uh, a pharmacist on Red Cross trains and he took many pictures. And I've been able to put some of his pictures um, at the train stations into Google and identify the train stations. But this was an easy one. This is the Valcluse House, which is in Australia, connected to um, my husband's family. and. Drop that in, came right up that it was about Clouse House. So try that with some of your mysterious um, locations and um, see if that works for you. So clothing. Maureen Taylor talks a lot about clothing. This is a two times great grandmother. And she lived in the eight, this is in the 1850s. And I know this, well, I know that she died in 1861. 
But I also know because in the 1850s, older women would wear caps like this. They also would have, you could see from the style of the dress, the tucks at the waist. And you can see that probably there was a hoop skirt here, 1850s, 60s. The other thing is that the cuffs and the collar are detachable. Um, women would wear their dresses over and over again. They wouldn't wash it every night, but they would wash their cuffs and the collar. And the way her hair is parted in the middle and behind her ears. So this is definitely an 1850s picture. This is her granddaughter, and this would have been in 1860s. You can see here that, that she's not wearing the cuff. She has, a, the, there's not, as, it's a hoop skirt, but it's not quite as wide. She could be pregnant in this picture. This is an early, a picture early in their marriage. Um, but her hair is also parted behind her ears. She's got a little ruffle on her sleeve. Her sleeves are a little bit um, wider, which was an 1860s style. Her husband has a mustache. His hair is a, a reflective of that time. He has a three-piece suit and his tie is reflective of the 1860s. So what they are wearing really can help you identify the year the picture was taken. Uh, this was, may have been a picture before they came to California. They came to California in 1868, or it may have been taken in San Francisco. Unfortunately, this, I don't have the original picture and it would have been nice to have seen the photographer at the bottom, but it's, it's not there. So uh, this is an early picture in their marriage. And um, you can see that her dress is a little bit different. Then this is their daughter-in-law. This is my grandmother, Kate. And she is graduating from the Chestnut Wood Business College in Santa Cruz in 1898. Um, but her dress also indicates it is the late 18. You notice the detail on her shoulders. That was very popular. Uh, you'll see peak sleeves or something, a detail. Often in uh, the historical dramas that we watch on TV, you'll see that uh, that time period has detail on the shoulders. Um, she has not quite as wide a skirt. And uh, her hair is that Gibson girl starting to be fluffed up, not parted down the middle, fluffed up and up in the back. So that would be indicate that this is late 1890s. And in fact, she did graduate in 1898. This is a setup. Probably they took each graduate, had them stand there, and then they moved on, and then the next one came. Again, the uh, Hotel Del Monte, but I wanted to show the clothes in this one. Uh, the, it was very popular to have children in plaids at this time. And the hats on these ladies with a high crown was an eight, late 1890s style. You can see the skirt is straighter and there's that apron overlay. So that is, and of course, at the Hotel Del Monte, they're gonna be more fashionable. They're not gonna be delayed in their fashion. So this would be, uh, again, an 1890s. It's also C.W.J. Johnson, we know um, actually took pictures during that time. This is my grandmother again in about 1904. She was a milliner in San Francisco. This is her business suit. This is what she wore to work. And of course she had to wear a stylish hat. So this is before she was married uh, in 1904. And then as the Brownie camera became more uh, popular and people were able to take their own pictures, people took pictures of, of everyday things. This is a glove factory. Um, Probably the lady on the left may be the proprietor, maybe the man on the right may be also a manager or boss. But you can see that the employees are in shirt waist uh, and straight skirts, shirt waist dresses, aprons. My grandfather is in the back. He's in a, a, a suit. I don't know. I don't know the story of this, but um, you can see the, the gentleman um, by the boxes holding up the gloves. And here they are picking cots apricots in the valley. Um, a lot of my cousins picked uh, cut cots uh, to earn spending money. Um, but this is, of course, uh, the turn of the century in Kingsburg. And my grandmother and grandfather are in the back row next to my great aunt, who's in that dark um, blouse on the right. And um, I think this is just a great picture of, of, of that time and that place. 
I did want to read to you just a little bit of a, a letter that um, was written by a great uncle to a cousin in Sweden. Uh, Swedish cousins um, shared with us letters that they had saved. This was written in 1904. Here we have nice weather every day. The fruit trees and the vineyards are blooming. It looks like we live in paradise. I just wish you were here to try the tasty fruit. We are now leading water to our land through large ditches running all across the lands. So he was writing from Kingsburg to Sweden about the fruit in Kingsburg. And if you have military pictures, be sure and try Google um, image search with them because they might be able to uh, actually identify the regiment um, by the hats, by the jackets. So give that a try. This particular one is, is a drum corps in uh, Monterey at the Presidio. So clothing can really give us clues to pictures. Now the automobile definitely can do that as well. This particular automobile was, uh, well, the, the people in the picture are my an aunt, my poet, my grandmother and grandfather, but my aunt was born in 1904. So this has got to be, she's maybe two, three, four, 1908, I asked my, I have a, an uncle who's a car enthusiast. I asked him, I said, what, what do you think this car is? And he said he thought that maybe it was a Franklin um, 1908. And um, that helps me actually uh, place that picture in time. And I'm not sure if this is in Seattle or like in Pebble Beach. Um, because they did live in the Tacoma area, but they were coming down to the Prunedale Ranch on an annual basis. So I'm not sure where that picture was taken, but I do know the people and I do know about the time. And then this is my great grandfather, Anders Petter. And here is the man who was a tenant farmer, worked from job to job, who came to America. He died in 1920. This is probably a 1918 Dodge. Um, the pride and joy uh, that he was able to afford. And here he is with his suit and his watch and his hat. Um, pretty amazing. But cars were definitely a statement and they certainly help us date pictures. Pictures would also honor an event. And this was a memorial card found by the Swedish cousins in a Bible, in the Swedish Bible which they were kind enough to send me uh, scans of the pages, which was amazing. And they sent me this picture and they said, and you'll notice that the postcard is written in Swedish. Who is this? We found this stuck in the Bible. And I didn't know. So I sent out the scans to my cousins and I asked, who is this? And one cousin immediately wrote back and said, oh, that was the first cousin, the first husband of cousin Elma. And he had tuberculosis and died very young. They were only married a couple of years. So that gave me um, a sense of who he was, and I knew what his years were, and I knew his name was uh, Johan uh, Nordquist, and I knew that he died in about 1904. So that helped me uh, identify that one. They were very big on taking pictures of at funerals, probably because it was a chance for the family to be together. And this was a great uncle who also died of consumption, and this funeral was on his ranch, on his property, and the families all lined up there. And you can see my great grandfather, Anders Petter, right by the coffin. He's um, surrounded by his two daughters. And the gentleman to the left of one of the daughters is my grandfather. And um, so it was a way of capturing the widow is, has the veil. She's to the left there, a way of capturing um, all of the family together. And, and of course I can date this because I know when he died. But sometimes captions can be helpful or they can be misleading. And this is a case which is surprising to me. I don't know quite uh, how this happened, but this was a house that my family lived in in San Francisco on Lincoln Avenue. And it's dated 1906. And of course we all know that 1906 is the year of the earthquake, but the children, don't look the right age. Um, I realize that the second picture is a little blurry because I enlarged it, but um, that girl is my aunt and she would only have been two years old in 1906. 
and the young boy is my uncle, and he wouldn't have been born yet. So this has got to be a little bit later. But nevertheless, this is their house. It tells me the address. And I do know it is uh, maybe 1910, might be 1910, 1912, might be a little bit more realistic. But they were in the earthquake, and um, they had stories to tell of that. Now, the photographer can give you all kinds of clues. And this particular photographer, Scrimseth, was in Fargo. And the DT stands for the Dakota Territories. So when he was taking pictures, um, it was North Dakota was not yet a state. So anything that had a DT on it was before 1889. Now, these are pictures of my North Dakota family. And you can see here, Hillsboro ND. So these pictures have got to be after 1889 because North Dakota has become a state. Jacob L. Scrimshift was born in Norway. So my Swedish family probably would have felt comfortable going to him. He had uh, a studio in Fargo in 1878. And then he had one in Buxton in 1881 to 1882. My family lived in Buxton. And then he moved to Hillsboro, and from, which would have been a larger town. He maybe have had more business there. From 1886 to 1902, he produced 100,000 photographs. In 1889, North Dakota became a state. And this family, John and Anna Sandgrid, would be about 30 years old in 1889. The kids, Lambeth and Agnes, maybe are about two and four. And they were born in 1887 and 1889. So this picture must have been taken around 1891 or 1892. They would have gone to Hillsboro, which was about 15 miles from Buxton. So that was quite a trip um, to have this picture taken. And then little Annie, who is in the second picture, was born after this time. She was born in 1893, 1994. So uh, they went back and had another picture taken by this photographer. The historical context, if we can place that picture in time, we can know more about it. So this is another picture from the Monterey Public Library. And this is taken at the Custom House. You may recognize that. This is the streetcar. Those tracks are for a horse-drawn streetcar, which was uh, built in 1891 in Monterey. Uh, this is a, probably a California family. Um, but in 19, 1891, an electric streetcar was installed in Monterey. So this picture has to be between the time that the, the horse-drawn streetcar was established and before the electric streetcar was built. So we have a 10-year, a decade there. We also can see that the uh, photographer, here's the family, is Cerulean, Monterey, California. And we know that he was in Monterey from 1890 to 1901. So there we have it. That picture was taken in that decade. So again, just to go over some of these things, identify the format of the photo, look at the background, the buildings, the garden, the clothing, the automobiles. If you can identify the event, that's great, a wedding or a funeral. Look at the caption, see if there's something about the photographer which of course you can look up on Google. And um, the New York Public Library has an index to photographers. Um, you can check that out too. I, I found a lot about the scrimship on that, the New York um, Public Library catalog of photographers and historical context. So those are all things that can help you identify um, a picture. And then we can add to that photo recognition. And photo recognition, of course, is controversial because we don't really know where this is going to go and how, uh, what effect this is going to have on, on um, our privacy or, or down the road. But right now, it really does help genealogists because photo recognition takes the shape of the face, the eyes, the nose, the nostrils, the ears, the hair, the eyebrows, and the teeth and identifies pictures that have similar aspects. It is a bit of a problem 
when uh, you're looking at a, a nephew may very likely look like uh, an uncle. Uh, and you may, sometimes I've found that it, it, it gets the generation wrong, but generally it's quite on track. Uh, it works better if the face is looking in the same direction. So if a, a face is turned to the right, then um, it can actually um, acknowledge another picture with that same uh, position. Facial recognition is on, on a lot of software programs. It's on the, the Mac photos, which I use. A Photoshop has facial recognition. Google Photos has it and MyHeritage, and there are others, um, but uh, it's a tool that is really very helpful. Uh, what my, my grandmother, Esther, um, I identified her pictures, some of her pictures on my photos um, program and immediately pulled up many pictures of my grandmother. So it is a, definitely a tool even picks up the baby pictures because it seems some of the same um, identification. Okay, so let's look at organization. Um, this is where it gets uh, a little overwhelming. Um, my, uh, uh, I live in Carmel Valley and like you all in Santa Cruz, uh, summer of uh, August, 2020, we evacuated and um, and I'm sure you went through this as well, we had to figure out what we were gonna take. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to round up all these photos. Now the photos um, that I had were not organized. My historical photos, I was pretty good on. I had, my dad had scanned it, I had scanned quite a few, but the pictures of my children in the last 30 years, I had not scanned. I looked at those lovely orange envelopes, enjoyed them, passed pictures around, and then throwing them in a, in a box and not done anything with them. So I went around the house, gathered them all up, put them in the car. And when I came back, I said, I have got to do something. So my daughter and I started to organize pictures by year. We went through one box at a time. This, was our, this has been our COVID project. We decided whether to toss, digitize, or put in an album. And if we were gonna toss, we kept one copy of each image. We asked ourselves, do we need all these photos of a vacation or an event? Um, maybe a couple would do. We selected the important pictures and we tossed the others. We got rid of the blurry over and underexposed pictures and we scanned the ones that we wanted to keep. So this, was, this has been a year long project. We took them by year, we organized them by year. Now, we do use plastic bins. This is not what you wanna do on a permanent basis because plastic will give off a gas, which is not um, good for your photos. So you want, to, you want to get archival boxes, but for the purposes of sorting, we sorted by year, we put duplicates and other photos we wanted to get rid of, and we save photos that we wanted to hand on to family and friends that, that, that they might have been interested in. So that was a big job. First, we did it by year. And then our, it was much more manageable because each of these boxes were uh, a few years. Oh, by the way, the, the, the archival boxes are the ones that are cardboard with the metal metal sides. And you can get that from a number of places. Gaylord is the one the libraries often use. Archival methods is a, uh, a, another one that I've used. And um, also hobby shops may have them too. So definitely you want to get your photos in, in archival boxes. So I had to look at my scanner. We all, you know, many of us have the three in one scanner where we can fax and print and copy. I wanted something that I could actually adjust a little bit more. So I went out and I got an Epson scanner, um, a V600 and a flatbed scanner. And I found that that worked really well for me. I also found that things that were three-dimensional, that is photos that were in a case, um, I really couldn't put that on the flatbed scanner, the reflection of the glass and all. So I, I recommend looking into Shotbox. I, I have a Shotbox and it's great for three-dimensional. You put your iPhone or your phone at the top and it controls the light and it really does a nice job. So um, you might explore that. I saw that at Roots Tech and, and I was just thought this was the greatest idea. Another way to scan is an app called PhotoMine. It is free to take a few of them, but if you're gonna use it a lot, you 
probably need to pay for a subscription, but it is really a handy tool. It's one of those kinds of things that's perfect when you're at a relative's house, they bring out the photos and you know they're not gonna let you take them out of the house, but you can take a picture of them. And the pictures are really actually, they're not a, a really high DPI, that's dots per inch. Um, they're, I think this one is only a 72. It's not, you want a 600 when you, scan your photos or 300 at least but it did a really nice job on a wedding invitation and a um a, a newspaper article so look at this as an app on your phone if you are visiting relatives and they may have pictures another tip is that if you have an album this is one of postcards of a, of a great grandmother who kept all the postcards your kids sent to her. You don't want to take it apart. You want to scan the pages. Don't scan each item. Um, this is what's called provenance, and that's the origin or the history of an article or an heirloom or a picture. And it tells a story. The person who put this together is part of the story. So you would want to take scan, perhaps in the shot box using that, the page itself, um, but you would not want to take it apart. This picture again of my grandmother, she kept a ledger when she was in Chestnut Wood Business School. She had a ledger and you can see what's on the back of these photos of, and, and it's stamped Chestnut Wood business school. So it was something she used at the school, whether it was homework or I don't know. But when she graduated, she must have put photos of the family in this book. Well, I don't want to take this apart because this is the story. Uh, the way she put these photos in the book tell a story. The fact that it was in this uh, book that she had when she was in school is really precious. So um, for me, I, I would need to scan the whole page. But the photo mine would take a picture of each of these pictures if I wanted uh, a separate picture. So that's something to consider when you're working with photo albums. Do you really want to take them apart? I scanned a lot of pictures and then I said, oh my goodness, I'm just going to use a scanning service. And I looked for deals. I've actually used three scanning services and I've had good luck with all of them. The first one is in Salt Lake City. You have to send your this is hard. You put them in a box and you send them off and you say a prayer. You hope that it will get there and get back to you. But it all worked out. The multimedia center, I sent VHS tapes and eight millimeter tapes <clears throat> of my family and uh, of when I was younger as well. And they turned out very well. I sent slides to photos, movies, and more. I started to do the slides and I realized that they just weren't turning out as well as I wanted. I needed maybe a more sophisticated uh, scanning um, device. So I sent them to photos, movies, and more. And then when I got into the uh, photograph uh, project, I sent those to Legacy Box. So watch for the, the deals and um, that certainly makes it a lot easier. What you want to do once you have your photos digitized is you want to create a digital hub on your computer. And that's something that will bring all of your photos together. The ones that you take, the ones that you've scanned, uh, the ones that you have Instagram, the ones that you have on Facebook. It's a way of, of consolidating all of your photos. And you want to organize a folder structure. You want to label your photos and you want to tag them. So this is how I do it on photos, which you can apply to whatever uh, photo management system you use. Um, I divided mine into family history and surnames. And you can see up there, family history, and then these are different surnames in my family. And then I made an album for each ancestor or each event. Um, you can see I have the Prunedale Ranch under Collins. And then for my current family, I started to divide it up by year. You could do it by month as well. Um, I put folders within the year, which would be like uh, celebrations was one, and that would include birthdays, graduations, weddings, holidays was another, travel was another, so that I could actually go right to these different folders and I could do a slideshow. I just simply click on uh, that folder, I do a slideshow and it's all ready to go. And then I labeled the photos. Now, this is one of the pictures in my grandmother's ledger book 
from business school. Um, photos has, this is the metadata. This is how you, you uh, put in the information about your photo. And I put in Helena Ross Collins, John Frank Collins, Billy the parrot, you'll see it's on his shoulder, on his uh, right shoulder, and Sandy the dog. Um, I don't, it's on their ranch. The date was in the ledger of my grandmother put August 1910. The location was Prudel, California, the ranch. And then for metadata, I put, I wanted to do, put a source in there that where I got this picture, I got it from the Prudel photo ledger, Catherine Monroe, 1897. Now, there may be people who have given me, uh, sent me digital copies of things. And I want to identify who sent them to me, or maybe the photo was taken by someone and I, that I, and I want to identify that. That's all in the metadata. And, you know, the problem is metadata isn't always um, passed from one program to another, but there are, you know, there are genealogists who are working on trying to standardize that. So what I do is try and put most of the who, what, when, where in my title. So I have the name, I have the date, uh, the what, the date, and the location in my title, and then I put any other metadata um, below. So when I pull up Anders Petter Anderson, I have a slideshow. These are all the albums I've created. My grandmother, Esther Nystrom, I have a slideshow. Because I've identified these photos by the place, they lived in Escalon, um, every Escalon photo will come up. So I have immediate slideshows or immediate albums simply by tagging and labeling my pictures. And you can do this with any photo management um, system. I also, um, because these programs were given, these uh, different things, these were documents that were shared with me from a cousin, Robin, um, I put that in the metadata. And if I put courtesy of Robin, all the things I got from Robin come up. So some of the photo organizers, the, the really good one is Adobe Lightroom and professionals. It definitely would be using that one. But there's a couple of others that are for genealogists, the Heritage Collector System, Memory Web, Collectionaire, Google Photos is certainly an option, Flickr is an option, and then I use Apple Photos. But just to give you a quick uh, look, this is what this is one that you can buy the software and you don't have to pay a subscription rate. It's called the Heritage Collector System. This one you pay a subscription rate. Uh, it's a wonderful program. I tried it and I just thought it was great. It syncs from Facebook, Dropbox, Family Search. It is definitely a photo hub. Um, you drop your pictures in, you put your metadata in, you identify it. And just like photos, the Apple Photos, you can pull up albums and slideshows and share with um, uh, family. Um, Maureen Taylor loves this program. She uses this in her work and with her clients. And then also it identifies the pictures related to different um, uh, people in, in your program. So Memory Web really is a lovely program. It's just that you have to pay a subscription rate. Also, it identifies the locations of the photos. Now, Collectionaire really intrigues me because it's like you can put everything in there. You can put videos, you can put audio tapes, um, you can put uh, photos, and it, you actually have a collection page that you can pass on to your family. Um, but this too is a subscription, but it's really clean. And uh, I played around with this in a bit. And I think this is a really a good one as well. Google Photos is great for sharing. Uh, I wouldn't put all your photos in Google Photos. Google is always changing, changing who owns what, but it is a great way to share. Great for a reunion, family reunion. What I do recommend is that your photos are on your computer. If you use an online or cloud-based um, service to organize them, make sure you back them up on your computer and make sure you have other backups. You know, after the fire experience, we've also been robbed. I was also in the Oakland Hills fire. I've had, I've definitely had the fire experiences. Um, we back up our computers and um, they say that really should back it up in three places. It should be on your computer, uh, hard drive, um, a web-based backup of some kind. So if you are not backing up your your um, wonderful genealogy and photo, photo information, um, consider that. It was Backblaze that saved us when we were robbed because they not only take your computer, they take the hard drive that's right next to your computer, but we had it on Black Backblaze. So we were able to uh, recover um, what we lost. 
Um, okay, now photo editing. Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom, of course, are the Cadillacs. Those are, um, there is a, a steep learning curve, but of course they are wonderful. And many of you may use those. Snapsheet is an app on your phone. I use Photos Map, but I want to just share with you quickly two that are really easy to use and which I am using now, Restore and My Heritage. Restore is, it's not a subscription, which appeals to me. You buy the software, it's yours. And it works like, oh, because of all these people talking about it, Lisa Louise Cook, um, Extreme Genes, Genealogy Guys, Marine Taylor, I had to try it out. I had to see what it was like. So I took this picture of Sarah Green, my uh, two times great grandmother. You drop it into the digital copy, select an image, you drop it in, and they give you nine options. And usually the best one is in the middle uh, on the second row. So I took that one and then I started to play with it, you know, lightness, contrast. It was really easy. And I got it so that I could see the detail of the dress, but I didn't want it to be a different color than the original one. Always keep your original, make a, a duplicate when you start to, you know, uh, edit. Um, so I, I did in fact um, add a little bit of the color so that it was still um, like the original. And I, I was really happy with this because I could see her hands, I could see the detail, I could see uh, the detail in, in her, her hair, her collar, which I couldn't in this picture. And it took away the light of, that someone had, obviously a flash when they had taken a picture of that. I worked on this muddy um, tin type of my grandfather. I lost the detail of the white uh, little uh, envelope that it was in, but it did certainly lighten up uh, the picture. This one I'm really proud of. This was a, a school picture of my grandfather in Kingsburg. I took this picture and look at how what it did to this one. I could see the three people in the uh, window and I could actually identify my grandfather. So that was pretty exciting to use to restore for that one. I also lightened up the um, picture of my grandfather with the butter churn. So it's very easy to use. It's, it runs about uh, $50 but you don't have to pay a subscription rate every month. So that's the advantage of that one. But also I took a document. This was something that I, I took from a database and it was kind of faint. So I worked with it and I, it was much easier to read after uh, putting it through Restore. Okay, my heritage. Maybe some of you have played around with that. My heritage is doing all kinds of things with photos, and you don't have to have a subscription. To, you can try it for about ten photos. The problem is they do put a watermark on the photo, but if you have a My Heritage subscription, this is what it will do. I took this picture and I colorized it. I certainly would keep the original picture. I was playing with this but I could see the faces better and I could identify people better once I colorized it. So that was really uh, helpful. I took this picture of my husband, um, which was not in very good shape. And um, after it took a lot of the, the folds and the crinkles out of that picture. So my heritage is doing all kinds of things. Okay, so now you've scanned, you've organized your pictures, you've scanned your pictures, and you want to do something with your pictures. Well, of course, the photo book, and so the holidays are coming up. It's a perfect gift. You might just want to do a scrapbook or an album. Just put the pictures on a flash drive and send them to the family. Say that I've scanned these, and these might be something. Label them, and these are something that they might want. Perfect gift, easy gift, and or a video or a slideshow if you're going to be together with your family over the holidays. Hopefully, we all will be. Um, so create a book. And these are some of the companies that I've used. I've used Shutterfly and Lulu, Blurb, um, the KDP, Amazon is um, people um, speak very highly of that. So create a book and you can do that between now and, and the holidays. Um, my father-in-law um, did wonderful scrapbooks and um, something like this, you know, maybe you, you're putting a scrapbook together, try and use archival paper. Uh, which he didn't, and I we need to scan this because it's this newspaper, which is highly acidic. But think about a scrapbook. Then there's always the flash drive. And then there's the video. And I wanted to share this as a conclusion of a video that I put together after we made a trip to Australia, my husband's um, where my husband was born, and um, put together some of the pictures. So I thought you might like to see what I did with this.
I have fond memories of toe-headed cousins. Excuse me. I have fond memories of toe-headed cousins, hot valley summers, Swedish meatballs, my grandmother's warm apple pie, the sound of crickets, and great aunts and uncles sitting in lawn chairs, sharing stories in their mother tongue. I was raised in the midst of a large Swedish family. My cousins lived in small towns stretching from Turlock to Kingsburg. I lived in the suburbs of the East Bay and delighted in visiting my San Joaquin Valley family. My family immigrated to California four generations ago and put down roots. Bob does not have the same sense of family as I do. His family lives nearly 8,000 miles away in Australia and New Zealand. His ancestors made their way from Denmark to Scotland to New Zealand to Australia to America. He does not have the same sense of place, of four generations of family living in one country as I do. So apart from immediate family, he has been separated from his tribe. My family's story is one of finding its place in California. Bob's family's story is one of separation, of moving on, always searching for a better life. So in February, 2018, Bob and I, our two adult children, Bob's sister and our nephew, made a trip to Bob's homeland to attend a family reunion. This would be an opportunity to share with our children their dad's story and his roots. We visited the houses where my husband lived, the schools he attended. He entertained us with stories of his childhood, the magpie that attacked him one morning on his way to school, the frilled lizard who bit his toe when he was hiking barefoot in the bush, the time he ran home to share with his mother that he could now read. We connected with the descendants of his Danish great-grandfather and his New Zealand great aunts and uncles. And so 50 cousins from Wellington, Perth, Adelaide, Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne arrived to honor the Nielsen family and Bob's remaining uncle. Four generations and five countries later, our California family connected with his family the family that Bob had said goodbye to nearly 60 years ago. Yes, my husband is now truly an American, an American citizen. He has lost his accent and has spent most of his life in America, but he is still an Australian and we delighted in hearing that accent return. Part of my husband will always be Australian and part will remain American. I think that that is the bittersweet situation for all immigrants. We were pleased to join him on this journey, and in the process, his family became our family. But maybe it was that way all along. So that was fun to share at, the, at, at one of our reunions. So by organizing your family's photos, you're keeping those memories alive, you're sharing the story of your family, and you're leaving a legacy for your descendants, just as your ancestors did for you. So I hope you have a lot of fun with this. Take it little by little, bit by bit. It's an ongoing process. I'm still, I will be working on it, I'm sure, the, for many years. But um, it was, I, I appreciate the fact that I was able to dig into it. And the fire actually was the one thing that got me started. I wanted to let you know what, what I'm up to next. Um, I um, have been doing a series with the Monterey Public Library and our next one, we, it's all things relative is what we called it, on October 14th at four o'clock. I'm gonna be talking about what are we gonna do with all of our stuff, our research, our genealogy research and the heirlooms that we have in our homes. Uh, particularly if our kids are minimalists, um, they're not necessarily going to want some of the things that we have. So we're going to talk about that, what our options are. And um, I am one of the leaders of the Off the Charts group. We meet once a month. We tell stories. 
And if that's something that interests you, we invite you to join us. Uh, Gail um, Burke, just get in touch with her and she can give you more information on that. But our next meeting is October 20th and um, at 1.30. So I hope that um, I will have an opportunity to see you before too long. Thank you. And I'm gonna turn it back to you, Gail, or to uh, Sarah and see if there are any questions. I'm gonna uh, stop the share now. We do not have any questions yet, but for all of you joining us this evening, if you have any questions for Kathy, please feel free to go ahead and type them into the Q&A. Down at the bottom of your Zoom control bar, you'll see the Q&A icon. And if you click on it, you can type in a question. First question says, how much money do you think you spent on your photo project? Well, that that's a good question. Um, it depends on how big you want it. Now, it is expensive to get uh, VHS um, digitized. And I really can't, um, I wish I could give you a, um, a per piece cost, but I have, I have spent a couple of thousand dollars and that has been over a five year period because I started with the videos and the uh, uh, Super 8 uh, film. And then I went to the slides and then I went to photos. So just piece it out and look for the, the deals and do what you can yourself. Uh, scan what you can. It's a little hard though for us to digitize our VHS and uh, it, it, it can be done. Uh, um, and some of you that are, are really technical, I know you could pull this off. But for me, it was easier to just send it out. All right, great. Thank you. Your next question says, what percent of your photos did you organize in that one year? I have done, um, I did about 10 years worth and um, I'm into the 19, I'm into the, I started with the 1980s, 1981, and I'm into about 1994 now. So um, of course we started to take digital pictures in 2000. So I'm finishing up with this decade and, um, I've sort of stopped for taking a break for a while. I'm trying to label, you know, the pictures come back from after having been digitized by a company and then it's, then we need to label them. Um, I kept them, I, I, they were in bags in order. So I know what the event was, I know what's the year, but now I want to digitally label them. Another tip is that when you put them into a photo management system, the date that will be in the metadata will be the date that you entered that picture in the system. You're either gonna to want to change that date, which your system will allow you to do, or you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the date is in the title that you assigned to the picture. Otherwise, um, a 1968 picture is gonna show up as um, 2021, and you wanna make a correction there. That is a, a problem, but of course, the, the organization system has no way of knowing what the, date, the actual date is. Well, speaking of metadata, um, can you please clarify how you enter and view photo metadata is your next question. Enter and view. Okay. Um, your system will have whatever you choose. Uh, now, Google, some of the bigger systems like Flickr and Google won't necessarily, they'll have their own system. But if you are subscribing to or purchasing a, a photo organization system, they will have a way that you can enter that information in. Um, and it varies as I showed you from uh, system to system, but it allows you to put the, your title, allows you to put um, a, a date, change the date and any other information, descriptive information you want. The problem is that if you are to export that picture, you wanna make sure that it's embedded in the picture and it goes to whoever you're sending it to. So you have to be careful um, how you do that. And I, I found that with photos, uh, map photos, I found that if I export it, I can do that uh, to, to other places, but you have to be sure that you see how it works on your system and every system's different. And this is a problem, Jeannie, you may have, heard this from other genealogists, the metadata is a, is a real problem. So that if you export it from Google to your, um, to your own system, you've lost 
Google didn't save it. Somebody else who put it in there had metadata. Google didn't save it, and you're not going to get it. So the way I've I've dealt with this, and this is a long answer because I've really thought about this, is I've had I have long titles with who, what, when, where, and if there's a why. And in those titles, I try and capture all the items that I want to be remembered about that picture. And that will be exported because it's in my title. It's usually the lower levels that gets lost. I hope that answers the question. If it didn't answer your question, feel free to just put in an additional question. Your next question is when you have a photo that fits into two categories, do you put the copy into two folders? Oh, good question. Yes, yes, you can do that. Um, that's a very good question. Say you have a category that's um, birthdays uh, and you just wanted to, you know, my daughter and I laughed about uh, putting together a show of all the blowing out of candles and uh, birthday cakes. Um, and then you might want to put that particular birthday, the 21st birthday or whatever it is, in the folder of that person. Yes, that's and that's a nice thing that you can do. Great, thank you. The next question says, regarding the various formats, was the timing of the introduction and use of the various formats the same across Europe as the U.S.? No, well, uh, Europe was a little ahead of us with some things like, for example, the carte de visite that was in France. So that um, we became interested because Queen Victoria and Napoleon III were uh, these cards were being exchanged. Um, the daguerreotype, I believe, is also Europe. So we are we're a little bit behind with some of these things. And then you have a lot of comments just saying thank you, Kathy, and we appreciate all of your uh, information. And then there are a couple of other comments. Uh, it says Legacy Box has sales, 40 VHS tapes for $589. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, they do have sales. So wait for a sale. Actually, I got mine through um, QBS or HS, you know, these different... Um, shopping uh there was a special so watch look on those too and it was actually half price so that was um that was quite worth it so wait for the sales and then we have another question uh, not necessarily for you but people would like to know if your if this recording will be available and it is it will be available in the coming days on the santa cruz public library's youtube channel. So if you go to santacruzpl.org, scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll click on the YouTube icon. It's the far rightmost icon at the very bottom of the screen. And we'll show you what that looks like. So Kathy, it looks like people would like to review this lovely session. Great. And I hope and that the hand I, handout will help. And my email is on the handout. So if anyone would like to um, email me a question, I'm happy to answer. And then they'd also like to link for the meeting at the Monterey Library. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I don't have it right here, but if they would go to the Monterey Public Library, that is not the county library, it's the city library on Pacific. And on their first page, their events are um, listed and just scroll down through the events and you'll see all things relative. Um, and it's right there and you can request a, a Zoom link. And that looks like it's it for the questions, unless I'm missing one. Victor or Gail, do you see any questions that I missed? I just see some comments, some wonderful compliments and comments. Yeah, no more questions, just compliments. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll be sure to forward on the chat to Kathy so she can see all of your compliments. Great. Thank and as she also said, are the Monterey Lib webinars recorded as well? That's one of them. Yes, questions. they are. And that's a good question. I've done, uh, I'll share the ones that I've done. Um, I did one on local libraries um, that available, historical um, museums and, and historical societies. I did one on DNA. Um, I did one on photos. This is, was a little different, but it is also on photos. Um, and I did one on homes. Every, every home has a story. And I talked about the Primdale Ranch. 
And I talked about um, my own home in Carmel Valley and the history of, of that home and how you can research your home. So they are available on the Monterey Public Library YouTube channel. And that series is all things relative, finding your family at the library. And you said that's the county of Monterey it, it, or the city of Monterey? City. It's the city okay. of All right. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for sharing your all your expertise with us this evening. I believe that Gail has some closing comments. If there are no other questions, I want to thank our speaker, Kathy Nielsen. I appreciate the encouragement and helpful strategies Kathy has shared with us this evening. And with luck, I'll begin to implement them. <laughs> And I, I appreciate Kathy's uh, letting us know that there are no necessarily quick solutions, but there are appropriate and proper solutions. And, and I appreciate that she shared them with us. Kathy has kindly permitted us to post the handout from her lecture on our website. And I believe most of our attendees this evening have already received it. But if for any reason you haven't, you can go to the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County and get lecture notes and handouts, and you will find Kathy's handout there. When you visit the website, you will also find the membership application form. If you are not already a member of the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County, we cordially invite you to join our society. Thank you again for being with us this evening. Please join us again on the first Tuesday of next month, November 2, at 7 p.m., for Terry Jackson's presentation on how to get the most out of the familysearch.org website and database. And I will now turn it back over to Sarah who will explain how to register for next month's program. All right, so if you head on over to santacruzpl.org and then up at the top in the green bar, up along the top, you'll see locations and hours, calendar, get a library card. You'll click on calendar and here you'll be able to search for genealogy or you'll be able to search by um, any other um, event that you'd like to search for here. You can filter by category, audience, branch, and then on site or online, you can scroll through the calendar. And once our, this next event is posted, I'm not quite sure it's posted yet, Gail, but once it's posted, you will see it here on our website. And so just as you did here, if we take a look at the, Kathy's presentation here, you can see register 41 seats left. If you click on it, you select the number of people attending and then click on begin registration. You'll enter your first name, your last name, your email, and then here this optional, would you like to receive related emails from this partner? This allows the Genealogical Society to send you emails. And then once you click that blue register button, you'll be able to receive the link. And then as we mentioned about being able to see our recordings, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom here, you'll see YouTube. So if you click on the YouTube icon, it'll bring you to our YouTube channel, and you can also click on the playlist. I'll show you what that looks like. So you'll see the banner up at the top, and then you'll see Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and then home, videos, playlists, channels, discussion, and about directly below that. I'm not quite sure if yours looks identical to mine because I realize mine is logging me and in as an administrator, but I think that you can click on playlists right here, this third tab over from the left. So we'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening, and we hope that you can join us again for another one of the Genealogical Society's events. Thank you for joining us and thank you to Sarah Jones and Victor Willis for your assistance this evening. We we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye everyone. Have a nice thank evening. And Kathy, thank you again. Thank you, Sarah and Victor and Gail.